Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Puya. I'm going to talk to you about the work that I've been doing with Co and Jim DiCarlo. I'm a postdoc and Jim DiCarlo. So the work is about controlling individual neurons' activities in area V4. So I'm also going to start by showing you a schematic of a convolutional neural network. I know that all of you guys have seen many of these <laughs> schematics this morning. Hope this would be the last one. <coughs> so. Um, what we know is that uh, recently, in the past few years, we have uh, dramatically increased uh, the accuracy uh, of the models that we have for predicting neurons in different areas, different regions along the ventral visual stream. These models are mostly convolutional neural networks, and the way that we, they're used to, to predict uh, the activity of neurons is that we first take a convolutional neural network, and then we, we train these parameters we train the parameters in the convolutional network by showing a lot of the images and then telling the network what object is the prominent object, object in those images. And by repeating this, many, this, this procedure many times, we, we basically optimize for parameters in these networks. Once we're done by doing that, then we fix the parameters and then move on to the next step, which is basically now recording uh, some uh, neurons' responses to the same images from different areas in the brain and then uh, basically finding a mapping function going from internal features of these, uh, these networks to predict the output the, or the activity of the in response to those images. So this would be after we do, we're done with this procedure, we have a model that goes from images to predictions of neurons, which is a, a, comp a, a, a image computable model. So this work was mainly done before by Dan Yamies and others in 2014, which they showed that uh, by following this procedure, you can have a, a relatively good prediction of the, the neuron activities, neuron responses to different images. And what I'm showing you here is basically a scatter plot showing the correlation between model prediction firing rates and the, the measured firing, firing rates, which are actually coming from the neurons. And these are like normalized uh, units, so it's not exactly firing rate, but it's a normalized version of this. So what we wanted to do next was to extend this. I know this is, this is, this might be very interesting to many people. We are making predictions about the outputs th that these neurons are making, but we thought this, this might not be the end of it. What else? So what we are here, we are trying to show is that uh, we're going to use these models in order to synthesize images now so that we can have control over the output of these, these neurons now. Basically, we want to control the we want to drive these neurons or population of neurons into desired states. So here we're going to talk about two specific cases. One is to maximally drive, or we call it stretching, the output of each of these neurons to, uh, to any values beyond what we've seen before. The second case is uh, we call it one hot population, which is basically we're trying to drive one neuron up while maintaining the responses of all the other measured neurons around the responses to the stimuli. So, uh, and the last step is basically after we finish synthesizing images, we show this to the monkeys and we record again responses of these neurons to these synthetic images. So the procedure, we do it for every neuron. We, we go ahead and um, use the gradients that we get from this model to, to generate different As you can see, these are the masks for receptive fields of a specific neuron. And we're changing the pixels within this receptive field in order to maximize the predicted response of individual neurons, in this case, neuron 1, neuron 2, example ones. So, uh, so what happens after we do this, I'm going to show you again the scatter plot that we had from previous slide, which is basically response of a particular neuron to uh, a number of naturalistic images. You can see one example here. These are 3D rendered objects on naturalistic backgrounds. And you see again the prediction and uh, the actual firing rate. You see there is a high correlation here. I'm pointing to this uh, particular image, which is like the best image we found in our it's like 640 images, and this is the, the image that maximally drives that particular neuron. And if you can see, this is very small, but I'm trying to show you here the receptive field of that particular neuron and what is inside of it. So this is, remember that this is a V4 neuron, so the, the kind of stuff that we usually look for are like combination of different edges with different angles or different objects. As you can see, like there are different edges with different angles and some circular stuff. And so what happens is that now we synthesize images for this particular neuron, and we go ahead and show it to the monkey, and then we record from it, and there you go. So we, what we've done is basically we've done this optimization, our, our model of 
predictive model of neuron, ac neuron activity driving, a lot, driving the, the neuron prediction along this axis. And we see that by doing that, we're actually driving the neuron's firing rate up. And we're actually, for many of these images, we're driving this beyond the previously observed values for that particular neuron. So let's look at how these images look like. So we did this procedure from multiple random seeds to get a sense of like what those images would look like, how they would differ, how they would be similar. And these are some of the, the examples that we got by doing this procedure. As you can see, there, these images, they look perceptually similar, but they're not exactly similar if you look at them in the pixel space. And that's what we kind of expected for neurons, how they work in this area. So we have kind of successfully stretched the firing rates of neurons beyond previously observed. Now let's move to the second aim that we had, which was basically driving, driving each neuron individually. So here I'm showing you uh, responses of 50 recorded neurons, these images. So basically, this is th these are two procedures that we talked about, the stretch, and this is the second one. We call it OHP. This is the, the image that was synthesized for this particular neuron in red, and this is, same, this is a similar procedure, OHP, that so the difference between these two is that we synthesize an image here to drive this particular neuron, but not caring what happens to the other neurons. But here in this optimization, one hot population, basically what we're trying to do to, during this optimization is to drive this particular neuron up while keeping every other neuron close to how they would respond to a noise uh, stimulus, right? So it could be either negative or very close to zero. And uh, the difference that I want to call your attention to is that while we ch change this optimization, we're actually getting closer to controlling the activity of individual neurons. What it means is that we can, we can drive this neuron's activity up and down while, while keeping the, maintaining the activity of every other measured neuron close to zero or negative. And here I'm showing you like two example neurons. As you can see, the, the optimization is not perfect, but the difference between these two are quite evident that we have a much better control by doing that. So we had aim one, which is we kind of got to it. And the second aim, we also almost got to it. And then we're happy. Ask me questions if you have. <laughs>